Hello and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We'll be getting started in just a few seconds here. Going to give everyone a little bit of time to get in. Thank you all once again. Okay, and it looks like our number has slowed down a little bit. So I am going to get us rolling here. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us for our Learning Libby with the Experts webinar. This morning, we have a lot of wonderful information we're excited to share with you all about the library reading app, Libby. We're going to start with the basics, everything you need to know for your day-to-day -day life within the Libby app. We'll take a five minute break where we'll test what you learned with our mini quiz, or you can get up and stretch or download the app. And then we will wrap up with our deep dive session. And I like to say this is the cherry on the Sunday. Some additional features you'll really benefit from and enjoy. But if today you only want to focus on the basics, you'll be able to kind of split up the session as you need. So first we should probably introduce ourselves. My name is Joe and I am here from Overdrive. You're probably already familiar with uh, the name Overdrive uh, because we've been around for a while offering eBooks and audiobooks. Whoops, hit the wrong button there. There we go. My computer has a mind of its own today. Uh, but so the Overdrive app was our original library lending app for quite a few years, but now we are so excited to be going forward with Libby uh, because Libby was built from the ground up with user feedback in mind. So we took notes from readers just like yourselves about what they wanted to see in their reading and uh, we kind of built Libby around that. Now at Overdrive, I'm a part of the digital bookmobile team and we have a large truck that we send across the US and Canada, helping different people just like yourselves get started and introduced to Libby. Now I'm here with the other half of the team. Hello, good morning. My name is Marissa. Uh, I apologize in advance. I'm a little sniffly today. So you might catch me uh, muting to sneeze, but uh, feeling good other than a stuffy nose. Um, I am Joe's other half um, when we're at work. And so I always give him a hard time and say he has the boring half of our job on the digital bookmobile team. So he hangs back in Cleveland and does a lot of the desk work, like our budget and um, planning our tour route, things like that. And then I get the, the fun half of our job, which is traveling with our digital book mobile. So in my two years at Overdrive, I've helped thousands and thousands of people learn how to use the Libby app, whether it's the basics, which we'll talk about in our first section, all the way into the tips and tricks, which will be our second session. So we're really excited to be here today. Definitely, we are excited to be here today. And uh, thank you for joining us. So let's dive in uh, first to the boring stuff. Marissa says that's you know my part of the job and she's not wrong. I have to take you through some housekeeping first. Just wanted to make note, we do have closed captions enabled for this webinar. You can adjust those in your Zoom meeting control using the box that says CC. By default, they should be on your screen, but if you want them off, uh, just tap into that box or if you want to adjust them at all, or if you'd like them on but need them out of your way, you can just drag them to a different part of your screen using your mouse. If you have questions, Marissa and I will be answering them throughout the entire webinar. If one of us is talking or presenting, the other will be responding, and you can send those questions in using the Q&A feature. So also in that same kind of frame around your uh, screen, there should be a button that says Q&A. Tap into that, type out your question, and send it through. Our answers will populate in that Q&A section. We are recording our webinar this morning, and we do this so you have a great piece to reference back to if you would like to see something again, if for any reason you need to hop off early, or of course, uh, if you kind of hit your limit, you know, maybe you just wanted to stick around for the basics and you want to do our deep dive on your own time, you can do that as well. 
You'll get an email tomorrow morning from Zoom that includes a link to this recording that expires after 30 days that can be downloaded to be kept permanently. Also in that email will be a link to our Getting Started PDF, which includes short video clips of everything we'll be covering in this Getting Started session. So if you don't want to rewatch the whole basics, you could just click into a video if you wanted to see just one quick thing again. We do have a survey that will pop up when you leave the webinar. Fill that out for us. Let us know what you thought of today and what we can do to improve. It really helps us grow. And then we'll be connecting our iPads into the webinar this morning. Sometimes Zoom cuts off the display for you know, a handful of people here and there. We want to make sure you can see Libby in her full glory. So we'll be sending out some simple instructions in the chat when we get connected, uh, just in case you need to adjust your screen ratio. And with that, the boring stuff is out of the way. And I am going to take everyone through the download and sign in process before I hand it over to Marissa. Now I do want to mention we recommend that you watch us as we go through this part of the demonstration this morning, you know, uh, just kind of take in the info we're sharing and don't necessarily aim to follow along. And then you can take the time to download the Libby app uh, once we hit that five minute break in the middle. Since we are recording, you don't have to take notes. You can just kind of follow along and ask your questions as they pop up, as opposed to trying to keep up on your own device. Now, I mentioned Marissa and I are both using iPads this morning, but the Libby app is available to download on Apple and Android mobile devices. So whether it's an iPhone, a Samsung Galaxy, a Google Pixel, an iPad, a, an Android tablet, you can download this app all for free. If you'd like to use Libby on your computer, whether that's a laptop or a desktop, you just need to go to libbyapp.com in your web browser. All right, I'm all connected. So the great part about Libby is whether you're using Apple, Android, or libbyapp.com, once we're in Libby, everything is going to look the same across those devices. The only difference we'll see is where we're going to download. So head into your app store or your play store. So on Apple, you're heading into the app store. Uh, Android is Google Play. And just head over to your search bar. From here, I like to just type in Libby and hit enter or search in my keyboard. Because when I do that, she's gonna be the first result that pops up at the top or she's gonna pop up right up near the top. And we see right here, Libby by Overdrive. It's this maroon app icon with Libby reading her book. Now, next to that name, Libby by Overdrive, on your screen, you'll either see Get or Install. And just tap Get or Install and let that Libby app download onto your device. Libby is completely free to download and to use, uh, but you just may want to have your App Store password handy in case you're prompted by your device settings to sign in. All right, once you give that a moment to download, you can leave the App Store and head over and find that freshly downloaded app on your screen. And when you open Libby for the very first time, she'll have a few questions for you to help you find your library and get signed in with your library card. You'll only have to do these steps the first time you set up a device. And then going forward, Libby will remember this info so you can always dive right back into whatever you're borrowing. So our first question here, do you have a library card? I'll say yes. And now we need to find our library. When you get your very first device set up, I recommend using search for a library. And we'll go through this in just a second. I did want to point out though, if you plan to use multiple devices like me, I use my smartphone and my tablet, you'll get your first one all set up using the steps we're about to go through. And then when you're ready to add that second device or third or however many, just choose copy from my other device and it will speed you through those steps. So you really only have to do that full setup one time. So we'll tap on search for a library. And now I like this option because I can type in the name of my library, the city I live in or my zip code. And I'm gonna use zip today.
And there we go. So we're going to have a couple results pop up at the top. First thing I wanted to point out is NC Kids. If you've got a kiddo at home and you're setting up a tablet for them, any library card in the state is going to give them access to the North Carolina Digital Library here. But what you're looking for, if you are looking for those um, uh, titles over that like juvenile kind of age range, is this option right here, North Carolina Digital Library. You may see a physical location that you go to listed underneath, but just remember there's 105 branches that have access to this. So this is one big shared digital collection across North Carolina. So I'm going to tap into North Carolina Digital. And now I just need to sign in with my card. So we'll tap on here, sign in with my card, as Libby's prompting us to do, and then you'll want to find your card from the list. So if you're joining us today from Buncombe, you would tap into here. My demo card today is a little farther down. And all we need to do from here is type in our library card number and then our PIN. Now, after you do this the first time, Libby's going to remember your library card for you, so you don't always have to have it handy to sign in. And this info is usually going to be on your library card under a barcode. Once your card number's in, tap next, and then pop in that PIN number. If you don't know your PIN, or if you have any trouble during these steps right here, just reach out to your friendly neighborhood librarians, and they will be able to help you out. They're the ones who kind of manage all that library card data. But just like that, I am all signed in. I can see my library card has appeared here on the screen. And now I know I can borrow up to six items in Libby at a time, and I can place a hold on up to six. We'll wrap this up by tapping on next. And now we have access to our library's complete collection of eBooks and audiobooks through Libby. That wraps up my portion. I'm going to hand it over to Marissa. She will take you through all of those basics there, everything you need to know for your day-to-day -day life in the Libby app. Marissa is using a demo library from Overdrive this morning, so you will see some different curated lists on her screen and maybe even some different titles or features, but all of the buttons and functionality of the Libby app are exactly the same. I actually, you need to give me permissions to share my screen. That never happens. Um, and then we also had a hand raised while we were going through the uh, sign-in steps. If you have any questions, then um, direct those to the Q&A feature within Zoom. That helps us uh, have a central location You'll be able to see those answers um, even after our session wraps up. So definitely hop into the Q&A if you have any questions and we'll get those answered for you. All right, thanks Joe for giving me the permissions. So before I hop into the basics here in Libby, I just wanna give a final reminder about the Zoom ratio. So. Down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see I have a navigation bar. It has five icons within it, search, library, menu, shelf, and timeline. If you cannot see that navigation bar, then that means you need to change your zoom ratio. So Joe just put the um, answers or the instructions in the chat for you. It's a couple of clicks and that will allow you to follow along with me much easier as we go through our demonstration today. All right, so I will talk about all of these icons throughout the presentation down here in my navigation bar, but we're gonna start out with the second icon that you see. It is a little library building and it says library directly underneath. And the library is what you're going to tap on when you want to browse your library's entire collection of eBooks and audiobooks. 
So I say browse at the library because it's a lot like if you were to walk into the physical library and you're just seeing what's on the shelves. You don't know exactly what you're looking for here. You're just seeing if the library has a book that is going to spark your interest that catches your eye. So on the library page, up at the top of the screen, you'll see that we have some filters for you. These filters are a great place to start when you're browsing. Just added is going to be a list of titles that were recently purchased by the library. So these are brand new to the collection. Available now is a really great place to start if you're someone who reads a lot and uh, you don't want to be waiting on wait lists for books, you can tap into available now and that's going to be a full list of titles that you can borrow right away so you won't have to join a waiting list for those. The last one I'll talk about here is subjects. If you are someone who is a subject reader or a mood reader, maybe you like mystery, romance, biographies, etc., you can hop into subjects and then choose which subject you'd like to browse by as well. So a really popular way to start browsing at the library. Now, as we make our way down the page here, I want to point out this section that is labeled guides. Now, guides differ from library to library, so yours aren't going to look exactly like mine do. Um, kids and teens, what that is going to do is point you in the direction of curated collections that are specific to those age groups. So that is a good way to find content for young readers. Now, as we make our way farther down to the screen, that's when you're going to start to see general curated collections that your library puts together for you. Now, these are a lot like if you were to walk into the physical library in the summer and you see a display showing beach reads, and then you go back in the winter and that changes over to cozy mysteries or holiday recipe guides. These curated collections that you'll see on the library page they're going to change throughout the year. The library is always gonna rotate them so that they can show us something fresh and new. So like I said, the library icon is what you're gonna tap on when you want to browse. We don't know exactly what we're looking for. We're just seeing if the library has something that sparks interest. In the instances where you do know exactly what you're looking for, maybe you have a specific title or author in mind, that's when you're going to tap on the very first icon instead. It's that little magnifying glass that says search. And here we can type in a specific title, author, you could even do a series name if you wanted as well. So I'm gonna search for the book Still Life. I'll type that in. I usually just skip these search suggestions because if you tap on search in your device's keyboard, then it's typically the first thing that's going to pop up in the list. So I always like to do that. Now, this is what our search results look like. We also call these lists. So if you hear me say a list, this is uh, what I'm referring to. Now, while we're looking at this list, there are two things that I want to point out for you. The first is going to be how you can visually tell the difference between an ebook and an audiobook. And the reason I point this out is because libraries actually purchase those formats separately. And that means you can't borrow an audiobook and then switch it over into an ebook halfway through or anything like that. You have to borrow it in the format that you want to enjoy it in. So when you're looking for an audiobook, you're going to be on the lookout for a square jacket cover. Right underneath that, you'll see a set of headphones and then the duration of the audiobook as well. So those are three visual indicators you can use to know that that is going to be a book that you listen to. 
Over on the left side of the screen, you can see the ebook version. It is a rectangular jacket cover. So it quite literally looks like a book in its shape. That is going to be a book that you read. Now, in addition to knowing how to tell the different formats apart, I also want to point out how you can tell if a book is available to borrow right away or if you'll need to join a waiting list for it. So you'll see the audiobook version of Still Life says place hold right next to that jacket cover. And going through the process of placing a hold is really quite easy. All you have to do is tap on place hold. That will bring you to the confirmation page. And Libby will even let you know approximately how long it takes until that book gets to you. And then you can confirm by tapping that big maroon place hold button. And Libby will confirm that you've placed the hold on the title. Now, once you've done that, Libby gives you a few options for what to do next. And because we haven't found a book to borrow yet, I'm going to go ahead and tap on keep browsing. And this actually just sends us right on back to the same list we were looking at. So you can see the audiobook version is now indicating that it's on my hold shelf. Now, if you want to borrow a book it, and it's available to borrow, it will say borrow right next to that jacket cover, like the ebook version. You can tap on borrow here if you'd like, but if you don't know what a book is about yet, all you have to do is tap directly on the jacket cover itself, and that will take you to the details page. So we'll get to figure out if this is a book that we want to borrow by reading that back jacket cover. And if we do, then you can tap on borrow right here on this page instead. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to tap on borrow. And this brings us to the borrowing confirmation page. Now up at the top here, I want to point out, you can see we're borrowing still life for 21 days. 21 days is the default lending period at your library and titles return automatically on their due date in Libby. So you don't have to worry about going in and manually returning them or uh, late fees. All right, we're gonna come down to the bottom here, that big maroon button and confirm that we wanna borrow this book. And this is when Libby's gonna to start to download the title for offline use. So you can see this circle here filling up as soon as it turns into this library card with the check mark on it. That means you no longer have to be on Wi-Fi or use cellular data to be able to open your book. So downloaded for offline use and good to go from there. Now let's go ahead and tap on open book. And this is where Libby's going to ask, do you want to read this ebook in Libby or do you want to send it to a Kindle? So if you have a Kindle device like a Paperwhite or a Kindle Fire, then you can tap on Kindle here and this will prompt you to sign into your Amazon account and you can deliver the book to your Kindle using this button here. Now, because it makes me sign into my Amazon account, I don't do it live here in session. It's just a couple of clicks. It's actually really easy but I do have a video in the PDF where I'm able to bypass signing in and you can see those steps if you'd like to see how to deliver it to Kindle. But I guarantee you'll likely be able to figure it out if you just tap on the button there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open this book in Libby here. We're just gonna show off a few of the key reading features in the Libby app. So up at the top and the bottom of the screen, when you open a book, you'll see some menus. Now we're counting pages here. And as soon as that's done, it's gonna show us our reading progress. So I'm on page one of 534. To make those menus drop off the screen so we can start reading, all we have to do is tap on the very center of the screen and they'll disappear. And then when you wanna start reading, 
you can tap or swipe on the right side of the page to move forward throughout the book. Now, one of the best things about reading um, digitally is that you can customize your reading appearance to meet your own needs. So we can get large print font and things like that. So I'm going to show you how you can set up your reading settings. What we're going to do is tap in the very center of the screen. That's going to bring our menus back up. And then up in the top right hand corner here, you'll see this A icon, that A stands for appearance. So if you want to change your reading appearance, that is the icon you're going to look for. All right, so in your appearance menu, there are three different things that you can change. The first is going to be your text scale. So like I mentioned, Every book can be a large print book if you'd like. So the slider here will increase or decrease the font size. Right below that, you'll see a section called lighting. Currently, I'm in bright mode. That is Libby's default. But we have sepia and then this dark mode available to you as well. This is really great for reading at night if you don't want that big screen or uh, bright screen in your eyes. And then lastly, we have book design. Now, book design is just Libby's fancy way of saying font style. So these are the different font styles that you can put Libby into. I will point out this open dyslexic font because it might help some users with dyslexia while reading. Now, I just changed all these to show you a little sneak peek of what it looks like with different reading settings. But I'm actually going to put these right back to where I normally like them. And that's because these settings are sticky. And what I mean by sticky settings is you only have to come into your ebook and change it one time per device. And then moving forward, Libby's going to remember those settings for you. So the books will be delivered with that large print font or that dark background. And you don't have to worry about changing it every single time you borrow a book. All right. Now that we're done with the appearance settings, I'm going to tap above this menu. That's what's going to drop it out of the way. And then we're going to leave this ebook and pop into an audiobook. So I'm going to tap in the center of the screen. That's going to make our menus reappear. And then up in the top left hand corner, you'll see this back button. And that is how you leave your books here. So we'll tap on back and Libby has taken me over to my shelf. So this is where I reorient everyone because we haven't found out what the shelf is yet. So let's go down to the bottom of the screen here. The first thing I'm gonna point out is this little bar that you see over on the right hand side. This is the now reading bar and it's Libby's way of giving you easy access to the last book that you had open in the app. So anytime you see that bar, you can tap on it. It's going to open up your book right back to the last spot you were at. I'm going to dismiss this for now, just so we can see that full navigation bar down at the bottom of the screen. So let's quickly just review what we've covered already in the navigation bar. First, we tapped on the library icon. It's that second icon. And this, again, is where we browsed for books. So it's like walking into the library. We have filters up at the top. We had the guides. And then we had just the curated collections that rotate throughout the year. Then we search for something specific using this magnifying glass. This is where you can type in an author or a, a title or a series name. We're now over on the shelf. That is the fourth icon that you see there. Looks like a little stack of books and it says shelf underneath. Your shelf is where your borrowed books, so these are the, bo the books that you have loaned out from the library in Libby and the books that you're currently on the waiting list for in Libby. 
So up at the top of our shelf, you can see we have some filters. If we specifically want to look at our loans or our holds, tags are something we talk about in our deep dive. So if you want to hear more about those, you can stick around for our second session. But here on the main page of the shelf, you'll see your loans and they're going to be ordered by the last time you open them. So here's the book that I just borrowed with you just a few minutes ago showing up at the top. And then as I make my way down the screen here, you can see some other books that I've borrowed uh, just this week. So I'm actually going to be opening up this audiobook here. So I'll tap on open audiobook. And there's just two quick things in here that are important to know as a new user. The first is your reading progress is going to show up at the top of the screen. So I'm 24% of the way through. I have 53 minutes into the book and then two hours and 47 minutes left. Down at the bottom of the screen is where we're going to find that player. So when you're ready to begin listening, all you have to do is tap on play. That will start the narrator. Now I can hear him on my end. You should just be able to hear uh, me instead. But the one important thing that I really, really let you new users know when it comes to Libby is that audiobooks are meant to play in the background of your device. And what that means is you can tap on play and then you can minimize the Libby app and start online shopping, or you could put your screen to sleep and start doing dishes. And Libby will continue to let you listen to your audiobook. Now, with that in mind, it's really important that at the end of your session, you come in and you tap on pause. That's going to stop the narrator from talking. And then you don't have to worry about losing your place in the book. Sometimes I see people just turn their volume down instead of pausing. And then you have to go and find your place again. So always come in, tap on pause, stop that audiobook, and you won't have to worry about that at all. All right. I'm going to come back up to the top here. We're going to tap on back to go back to our shelf. And we're going to reorient again down at the bottom of the screen. So let's go down there. You'll notice that I have a new now reading bar. It's switched over to that audio book because it's always the last book that you had open in the Libby app. I'm going to dismiss that again. So your shelf is your current loans. These are books that you actively have borrowed from the library in Libby or you're waiting on the wait list for. Right next door, you'll see this little clock and it says timeline underneath. This is all of your history throughout the Libby app. So this is going to show you everything that you've ever placed on um, hold, anything that you've borrowed, and all of your returns. So just keep in mind, shelf is current. You can pull it off the bookshelf and read it because you're in your lending period. Your timeline is your history everything you've ever done in the Libby app. We are gonna finish off the getting started session talking about the menu. That's this very center button here in the navigation bar. So you can think of the menu as your app settings. Um, if you'd like, up at the top of the menu, you'll see this little gray box on my screen. And this is where you're going to find any of your in-app notifications. And I'll talk about what that is here in a second. I don't have any in-app notifications right now. So Libby's actually prompting me to manage my notifications instead. Now, Libby's going to bring this menu to you the very first time you place a hold. So you won't have to come in here and find it like I am. But I'm going to open up those notification settings to show you what that's going to look like when Libby does prompt you to manage them. So up at the top of the screen here, you'll see there's three ways to be notified. And by default, Libby is going to have everything set to this blue notification line. The notification option here is a push notification. And push notifications appear on your device's screen 
regardless of what app you have open. So that means you could be reading the news, you could be looking at Facebook, and if a notification comes in, it's going to appear on your screen just like a text message would. Now, if you'd like, you can switch that over to a menu match. That will be an in-app notification. And that means it only appears in Libby. You have to open up the Libby app to see it. And I just showed you that gray box that was at the top of my menu was where those will appear. So those are your two options for how to receive your notifications. Of course, if it's something that you don't want to be notified about, you can set it to ignore as well. Now, right below the ways you can be notified, you'll see all of the things you can be notified about. I want to talk about hold ready here for a second. So I really recommend that you keep your hold ready notification set to that blue push notification option. And the reason I recommend that is because when it's your turn on a waiting list, Libby is going to give you a three day period where that book is sitting in limbo and you can um, you will be the only person who can take action while that book is sitting in limbo. The three actions that you could take are to borrow the hold, cancel the hold, or have the hold delivered later. You know, delivered later is a great feature. If you get busy and you don't think you'll be able to read the book during your lending period, what you can do is set a time period to stay at the top of the waiting list, and then you won't lose your place in line, and Libby will just deliver it again after that time period ends. So in the three-day limbo period, if you don't either borrow, cancel, or deliver later, Libby will automatically deliver the title later one time as a courtesy, and then you'll be prompted with another three-day limbo period. In the second three-day period, if you don't take action again, that's when Libby's going to cancel your hold. So you'll have to go and find the book again, and when you rejoin the wait list, it's going to put you at the bottom. So that is why I always recommend to keep your hold ready notification set to that push notification. It's gonna appear on your device's screen no matter what, and you can take action quickly and you won't lose any of your books or your spot in line. It can be a real day ruiner for me when I wait a couple of weeks so that I forget to do it and I have to wait another couple of weeks because I go back to the end of the wait list there. So. So I harp on it a little bit. I'm going to come back up here and tap on back. This just brings me right on back to that main Libby menu. Right below the notifications, you'll see this section that's labeled your libraries. I have currently two demo library cards attached meaning I can tap into each of these libraries individually, see what books one library bought that the other didn't, compare holds lists, things like that. You can add additional libraries to Libby if you have a valid library card to that library and it uses OverDrive services. Now in North Carolina, all of your libraries share a single uh, digital collection. So you'll be accessing the same books no matter what library card you have there. But I wanted to point this out in case, you know, maybe you travel uh, half the year to another state, you have a library card there, that's an option. And then also you can add multiple library cards if you share a device with family members, but you each want your own uh, holds and loan limit, maybe you don't want to share. My siblings certainly would have fought over a five hold limit, things like that. So you can always add additional library cards. We're going to finish off the getting started session down here in help and support. We just have two things to talk about under here. The first is going to be in this settings menu. So I'm going to tap on settings here. And then once I'm in the settings, I'm just going to scroll down until I find customized navigation. And I'm going to tap into this. Now, here under navigation bar, you'll notice that my labeled icons are toggled on. 
That is why my icons down in there, navigation bar, say search, library, menu, shelf, and timeline. By default, these are toggled off and they're just going to be the icons. So I point this out just so that when you're just getting started with Libby, you can watch this recording and follow these steps to uh, turn your labeled icons on. And this will really help you navigate as you get used to the app. All right, I'm gonna come back up to here at the top. I'm gonna tap on back twice. That's gonna take me back to that main Libby menu. And then the last thing we'll talk about here under help and support is getting some help. So if you have any questions after our webinar ends today, there are two ways you can find help and support directly in the Libby app. The first, I like to just call it a self-guided help. This is you asking Libby, so the computer is trying to answer your question for you. This is really great for simple questions like, how do I return a book before its due date? You know, even though we know that titles return automatically, maybe for some reason you want to return it early, you can type in a keyword here and the computer is going to try to bring up help articles for you. So these are the two ones that she thinks is relevant. I'm gonna tap on returning books. And down here, you can see Libby is giving me the instructions on how to return a title early. Now, if you have a more complicated question or maybe Libby isn't giving you the article that is most relevant or you have a deeper issue, you can always come down to ask our support team. These are real life, living, breathing, very friendly folks at Overdrive and you can let them know you have a problem, a question or an idea, and they will help answer your question or troubleshoot you, uh, shoot, troubleshoot with you, there we go, via email. They usually get back within a 24 hour period. It's most often much quicker than that, just a couple of hours, uh, but they will get you back up and reading and your answers, your questions answered. So that is actually everything that you need to know when using the Libby app. I'm gonna let Joe take back over on the screen here and he's gonna get us into some next steps. Thanks, Marissa. So let me find where my clock went. There we go. We have a little bit of time here. I am going to say that we're going to take um, this little kind of enter our break period. And if you're going to step away from your computer at this time, just please be back by 1050. That is when we'll head into our deep dive. But some quick next steps. So I want to welcome everyone to use this time now to ask us any questions. Of course, you can even ask questions anonymously. You're also welcome to take the time now to download the Libby app and start signing in or playing around. Um, we'll be here for you. We are going to use this time. We've got some quiz questions we'll throw up, see what you learned, um, and kind of give you the opportunity to ask questions based off of those. And then, as I said, at 1050, we'll head into our deep dive session where we look at four of our favorite features in Libby. Now, I recommend only sticking around for this session if you are feeling confident and ready to learn more. We don't want anyone to leave feeling overwhelmed. So I'll give you a last call. You can decide if you want to hop off early and you can do that before we go into the deep dive. Because remember, we are recording this morning, so you'll have the option to um, review anything you might have missed from the point you hop off. So just keep that in mind. And with that, I am going to take us into our quiz here. Once again, like I mentioned, we will resume at 1050, but feel free to send through those questions and uh, uh, get up, get yourself some coffee, get a stretch and whatever works for you. Now these questions are going to appear automatically on your screen. Give them your best answer. If you aren't sure of the answer, either give it a good guess or unsure is available. They are completely anonymous, so just go for it. All right, for question number one, we're gonna hang out in the navigation bar. What do you tap to browse your library's collection? 
the magnifying glass, Libby, uh, I'm sorry, the library button, the menu, the stack of books, or the clock. So this is when you want that feeling of walking around the digital library. You don't know exactly what you want yet. You're not looking for anything specific. And I'll close this one in five, four, three, two, one. All right, lots of great answers coming in. So let's see. When you want to browse your library's collection, in the navigation bar, you'll tap on that library, just like you go to the library to get a physical material. Up at the top, you can use the filters to help refine your search. You could hop into one of your library's different guides that they have available, or you could jump into any of their different curated lists, which function just like those shelves in the building, different things put together to pique your interest. If you know exactly what you're looking for, that's when you go to the magnifying glass and you can type in a title, an author, a series name, um, or even like a keyword, and you'll get some search results that way. All right, for question number two, we'll still be in the navigation bar. What do you tap to find your current loans and holds? So same answers, magnifying glass, library, menu, stack of books, or clock. So where do those borrowed materials live? Where do you go if you want to check your place on a hold list? All right, and I'll close this one in five, four, three, two, one. All right, excellent work, everyone. So your borrowed materials, your loans, your holds, all of those live on your shelf. And to get to that, we'll head to the navigation bar and tap on that stack of books. From there, you can use the filters up at the top to see just your loans or just your holds, and even check out your tags, which we'll talk about next. And if you scroll through this page, you'll see everything you have currently borrowed from your most recent uh, open book to your oldest loan. Okay, for question number three, let's dive into an ebook. What are the three ways you can customize your ebook's appearance? So you can change the text scale or the size of the font, the lighting or the background color of the page, the book design or the font the book is written in or language, the language the book is written in. Three correct answers out of four options available. What do you think? All right, and we'll close this one in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we got a couple of you with our trick there. So let's look at it. When you want to adjust your settings in an ebook, tap in the center of the page and tap on that A icon. From here, you can change the text scale or the size of your font, as large or as small as you like. Next, you can change that lighting. Bright is the default, but you'll find what works best for your eyes. And then lastly, you can change the font the book is presented in. There are five pre-made fonts available, including the publisher's default, the way that the print book was made. Um, and I also like to point out that custom option, which lets you change uh, some settings, uh, like the lines or the spacing of the lot uh, between the lines. I can never say that right. It allows you to customize and adjust the amount of spacing between lines of text. Now, for those of you who answered language, that is a great answer. Uh, your library does offer titles in different languages, but you are not able to change the language of a book. It has to be available in that. So just like you have to decide if you want ebook or audiobook, you'd have to decide if you want that in a different language as well. And Marissa's got some great tips and tricks here for us for how we can filter out different languages. And with that, I will wrap up our quiz there. 
And this takes us to the end of the getting started portion of our morning. So this is that last call I wanted to give everyone just as you know, a reminder, we are about to head into that deep dive session. So if you've taken in all the info you can for today, kind of at your max capacity, no worries. Uh, this is the point where you can leave. You can hop off here, tap leave in the bottom right hand corner of the screen and exit the webinar. Remember, you'll get that email tomorrow morning from Zoom. That will include the link to the recording, which will show you the whole deep dive. So feel free to take the time now if you want to exit, and if you get the chance, fill out the survey that pops up on your screen. Thanks so much for joining us. For those of you sticking around, we are heading into our deep dive now. So just two quick reminders. Once again, closed captions. You can adjust those as you need in your Zoom meeting controls. And you can ask us questions throughout the entire webinar. You can still do that. Use that Q&A button also in the meeting controls. This session we do a little differently. Some questions I'll answer in the background while Marissa's presenting, but we tend to save most of them for the 10 to 15 minutes we have at the end of this session. So Marissa will cover our four tips and then we will demo anything you'd like to see live on screen in Libby. So keep that in mind. You might have to wait a little bit for your answer, but you will get one. All right, our four tips and tricks that we'll be talking about today. Whoops, this is the wrong screen for y'all. Your library does not have magazines. Sorry about that, folks. We're going to start with customizing your browsing experience so you can uh, filter out languages. You can find exactly what you're looking for all the time throughout the whole app. Then we will talk about filtering and refining lists so you can find the books that you like faster. Then we will talk about our favorite tip of them all, tags, what they are, how we use them, and some ways you might want to incorporate them into your life. And then we will wrap up with making and exporting notes and highlights. Great for um, those of you in book club, uh, anyone who is interested in, you know, just kind of writing all to heck in their book without actually damaging a library book. You can make as many notes as you like. So Marissa, I'm gonna let you take over on the screen here and dive in to our first tip. All right, thank you, thank you, Joe. Let me get connected here. All right, so we're gonna hop right into tip number one, which is all about uh, setting preferences. So this is going to be a good tip for anyone who wants a permanent way to filter lists in Libby. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tap into this available now filter just so that we're looking at a list for this uh, tip. And you'll see that we're starting this tip out with um, almost 70,000, 75,000 books starting this list out. Hey, Marissa, I'm gonna yeah. interrupt you. It looks like um, not all of NC Digital has magazines, but it does look like Buncombe where we're at today does. Do okay. you mind actually okay. starting off with magazines? Thank I'll you. do that instead. Okay, changing gears here. We're gonna start with magazines. So actually the, uh, the ways to find the magazines are the same that I showed you in getting started. So we have the, um, the uh, library where we can browse or if you wanna search for a specific magazine, you can also do that on the search icon. I already have a magazine downloaded to my shelf here. So I'm just gonna open that up, save us a little bit of time. And we'll talk about a few of the ways that you can navigate throughout the magazine experience. So you'll see that Libby is actually synchronizing me across devices on another device. I'm on page 32. I'm gonna go to page one here to start out with you all. 
So when we open up a title, uh, a magazine title, we'll still have menus up at the top and the bottom of the screen. You'll notice that magazines also have uh, thumbnails outlining all of the different pages as well. And if you'd like to use these to navigate throughout, you're more than welcome. I've seen quite a few people do that. They strain my eyes a little bit. They're a little small for me, especially on my iPad mini. So I don't do that, but of course you can if you'd like. These will just link you out to those specific pages. Now I'll talk about a few other ways you can navigate as well that are a little easier. So I'm gonna tap on the center of the screen to drop our menus off the screen here. And then we can tap or swipe on the right side of the screen, just like in an ebook to page forward. Now, if you are someone who uh, occasionally borrows a magazine because you saw one specific article on the front uh, cover, you're like, I wanna read that article, but I'm not interested in all the rest then what you can do is uh, tap and swipe until you find the table of contents. And then these are all links out to all of the cover articles. So maybe we wanted to read this article about space. You can tap on that article in the table of contents and Libby's gonna take you right on over to that page. So we're now on page 28 skipping all those ads and all those other articles we're not interested in. Now, this is what I call the traditional magazine view. And if you are on a larger device like a computer or an iPad Pro, then you can certainly use the traditional magazine view. It will likely be large enough for you to see. I'm on an iPad mini, so you can see this text is quite small. And down at the bottom of the screen here, there's a little circle with the page inside. This is the article view. And if you're on a smaller device, this article view is really going to come in handy. You'll see why here as I tap on it. The article is going to come up in this scrolling menu. And now you can see that text has actually taken the reading settings that I set in my ebook experience and carried it on over into the magazine experience. So this is the size of the font that I like. It will also carry over your background color if you set that as well. If you haven't hopped into an ebook yet, you can change your reading settings in the magazine as well. So this menu is really quite handy. It's a, a full scrolling menu. You can read that full article and you're not gonna to have to strain your eyes. Now over on the left side of the screen here, you'll see arrows pointing forward and backward. If you tap on these, this is going to keep you in the article view. So we're not going back to that traditional magazine view uh, and opening and closing this menu over and over again. We're actually staying in that article view and we're able to go over to the next article and then scroll down to read it. Right in the center of the pointing arrows, you'll also see this icon looks like a little table of contents. If you tap on that, you'll be able to choose an article from the table of contents. But again, this is gonna keep you in the article view. So you're not having to close it, open it back up, Let's say I want to uh, read this article here. I'll tap on it. Libby takes me right on over and I can enjoy this one now as well. Now, when you are finished reading your magazine, first you have to leave that article view if you're on the smaller device. To do that, it's this done button down at the bottom. That's going to take you back to the traditional view. And then you'll tap on the center of the screen. And you'll find that back button up in the top left hand corner. So you can use the thumbnails, you can tap and swipe, 
You can use the links within the table of contents, and then you can also navigate throughout using that article view. And those are the different ways that you can navigate throughout your magazine experience. All right. We are going to go right on back to the tip we started on here, which was at our library. And again, this is all about finding the books that you like faster. So we'll go over a permanent filter and then we'll go over temporary filters as well. So let me hop right back in to available now. And again, we're starting out with 75,000 books here. So we can spend all day looking for a book this way, but I'm gonna show you a few ways we can start narrowing that down. The first is a preference. So this is over on the left side of the screen here. You can see the word preference. Preferences are filters that are saved and applied to all lists. And what that means is as soon as you set a preference on your device, Libby is going to remember that preference no matter how many times you open and close your device, no matter how many times, uh, how long of a period it goes by between opening the app, you could come back a month from now and Libby's still going to remember those preferences. And this is a good way to filter books if you just know I'm never interested in a certain type of content. So I'll give you a couple examples of that. The biggest one that I see when I'm out on the bookmobile and one that I use as well is language. I only speak English much to my high school French teacher's dismay. And so when I look for a book, I only want to see books written in English. I don't want to see books uh, coming up in my searches that are Spanish or French or Russian because I'm not going to be able to read them, right? So instead of any for language, you can change and select the language of your choosing. It's limited to one. So if you're uh, bilingual or multilingual, uh, you might not want to set a preference. Uh, but if you only speak one English, then a language preference is really handy. And that will make sure every time you search for a book, you're only seeing books that are written in that specific language. So in this instance, only books written in English. Another popular one that I come across quite often on the bookmobile is format. So, of course, we have books, uh, audiobooks, and magazines. If you are only interested in one particular format, maybe you love audio, but it strains your eyes to read ebooks or read magazines, then you can select an audiobook preference. That way, when you're searching for books, you're not having to look past all of the ebooks. You can just see audiobooks in your searches, and it'll speed that up for you. And you could do that with any of the formats. If you just are interested in magazines, you'll choose magazines. Just interested in ebooks, you'll choose books. Now, the last one I'll talk about here that is quite uh, popular that I noticed is audience. Right now, when I look for a book, I'm seeing content that is, it could be a picture book all the way up to, you know, 50 Shades of Grey. So under audience, if you have especially young kiddos or something like that, you can set preferences as well. Uh, if you want juvenile or YA, that's gonna limit them to uh, juvenile and YA content and they won't come across 50 Shades of Grey. Now for you, you have an entirely separate NC Kids uh, collection. So that is going to do the work for you, but I'm pointing this out in case you add additional library cards as well from other states. Okay, I'm going to leave my preference at English, and what we're going to do is make sure you scroll down and apply the preference. If you don't tap apply, then it's not gonna do anything for you. And you'll know that that preference is applied if a number shows up next to that preferences button. So I have one preference, it's my English preference, and I'm good to go now. So that is how you can apply a permanent filter, one that's saved and continues to filter your lists no matter how many times you open and close the app. 
Now we're going to talk about a temporary filter. And this is going to be if you know you have a one off instance where you're looking for a particular type of book, but you don't want Libby to filter your search every single time just for that particular instance. And this is going to be using the refine feature over on the right side of the screen. And for this, I'm going to do a little prompt. So let's say I'm going to go on a road trip with my mom. So we need an audiobook to listen to. My mom likes mystery historical fiction books. So I'll let her choose the subject here today for this prompt. And then last but not least, let's say we're looking for a new release, something that came out in the last year or so. So we're starting with 70,000 books. Let's start narrowing that down. What I'm going to do is come to refine. And the first thing we're going to choose is our format. Now, I like ebooks, audiobooks, and magazines, but for this particular moment, I just want audiobooks. So I'm going to set that temporary filter. I've already dropped this number down to 22,000. You'll see this shrink and shrink as we go. I'm going to come back to refine. And now I'm going to choose my subject. So I, like I said, my mom likes mystery, historical fiction. So I'm going to choose mystery first. We've dropped down to 2,800, but she likes mystery, historical fiction. She likes uh, both combined into one. So I'm going to come back to subject find historical fiction. And now that number has dropped down to 217. So I point this out so that you know you can find niche subjects. You're not limited to something broad like mystery. You can continue adding subjects and Libby is going to narrow that search down for you uh, by showing you those niche subjects. These are books that are both mystery and historical fiction at the same time. So not mystery titles and historical fiction titles, but they're both. And between two and four of these subject filters is really the sweet spot. Once you get past that, Libby is going to come back and be like, there's not a book in the world that is a comedy, horror, historical fiction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Two to four filters for subjects usually gets where you need to go. I'll come back down to refine. We have one more criteria to meet and that is a new release. So I'm gonna come to refine and then scroll down until I find sort by. Right now we're sorted by popularity. Instead, I want to sort by release date. That's going to make sure the newest titles show up at the top of the list. And then as we make our way down the list, they'll get older and older. And so we started this tip here, 70,000 titles. I would have been searching here all day long had I tried. Uh, but now it's narrowed down to 217 and we'll be able to find that book so much more quickly. That is how you can filter and refine your searches so that you can find books you like faster. Okay, so we are going to stay on this page here as we move into tip number three. And tip number three is all about tags. So tags are a way you can organize books in Libby. This is one of the differences between the OverDrive app and the Libby app. So the OverDrive app gives you a wish list and a history, but you're limited to those two lists. Libby's tagging system is really robust. You can create as many tags as you'd like, and you can name them whatever you'd like, and you can export them out of the app if you want to share them with a friend or a family member or a, a fellow book clubber. So let's go ahead and talk about tags and how to create them here. So let's say I am scrolling through this list and I come across Clark and Division here. And I do want to read it eventually, but maybe not right now for my mom and I's road trip. So I'm going to save it for later by tapping on tag. Now, when you uh, 
can choose a tag. You can create a new tag if you'd like, if you want to start a new list, or you can add uh, it to an existing tag by tapping on one of the tags you already have created. Regular tags don't have any special abilities in Libby. You just use them for organization's sake. So this could be a wish list. This could be uh, recipes from magazines that you want to remember. You could even create tags for uh, gift ideas. So I have a lot of readers in my family. If I come across books that they might like, I'll tag them throughout the year. And then when Christmas rolls around, I can open up that tag while I'm at the bookstore and find those really quickly. So you can really use regular tags in how, whatever way you'd like. You can create as many as you'd like but they don't have special abilities other than you're just creating them to stay organized. Right below that, you'll see smart tags, and these do have special abilities. Libby is doing something with these smart tags for you. The first smart tag you see here, this is a borrowed smart tag, and the borrowed smart tag is automatically applied to any books that you borrow in Libby. So just keeps track of all of your borrowed books with this little receipt that you see there. Right below that, you'll see the notify me tag. This is currently specific to magazines. And what it does is the first time you borrow a magazine, Libby will prompt you to create a notify me tag. And then once your notify me tag is created, you can tag all of your favorite magazines and Libby will alert you when new issues are uh, in the library. So you won't have to keep on searching for the same magazine every week or every month to see if new issues came in. You'll be able to get alerted instead. So smart tags, special abilities, regular tags just for organization's sake. Let's go ahead and create a new tag together here just to show you how easy it is. So I tapped on new tag. Here we can type in what we want our tag's name to be. I'm a big genre tagger because I'm a mood reader, so I have to be in a specific mood to read a mystery book. I'll go ahead, label this uh, mystery. I don't need a description because I know what that means. And then I'll tap on done. And you'll see that that tag now appears next to the jacket cover while we're looking for a book. And this is actually one of the reasons I love tags so much, because you can see this title over here is on my to be read, so my wish list. So had I been looking for a book for my mom and I's road trip and I came across this right at the top, I probably would have borrowed it right away. I wouldn't have wasted my time looking at the other 216 books in this list. I could save some time and borrow in the Garden of Spite. Let's say that didn't show up and I'm scrolling down and I come across Devil in the Dark Water and that has my borrowed tag next to it. Well, this is letting me know that I've borrowed this book in Libby before. And prior to this being created, I can guarantee you I would have read the first 50 pages or listened to the first 20 minutes before I really remembered that I'd read that book in the past. So that is why that borrowed smart tag really comes in handy. We can see it's borrowed before. I'm not even going to waste my time reading the sample and I'm going to skip on over it as I continue looking for the book that I'm going to borrow. So that is how you can create a tag. Now let's go and look at our lists. So I'm gonna come over to the shelf. And up at the top of our shelf, you'll see the tag filter next to your loans and holds filters. When you tap on tags here, this is gonna show you your tag list. So I have my wish list with 36 titles, my cooking list, that tag that I just made with you as well. Let's go ahead and look at my wish list though. I'll tap on wish list or TBR. And here you can see all of the books that I have marked as to be read. Now over on the right side of the screen, there's a couple different icons that you see here. This is the library card icon with the plus sign. 
and that's a little calendar with a clock. And this double hash mark means that that book no longer exists in my library. So I actually need to delete that, but we'll talk about that or I'll do that later. So these two symbols here, if you tap on those, you'll be able to borrow or place a hold on that book directly from that screen. So you don't have to go and search for the book. You can borrow it right here and you'll actually find that symbol everywhere in the app. You'll find it when you're searching for a book or, or looking at um, any of the catalog guides or curated lists and in your tags. Another nice thing about this little menu here is if you scroll down, you can also see all of your library cards that are attached and Libby will show you how many copies are available at each of your libraries or in this instance I don't have any copies in my second library so this is a kind of workaround to searching across multiple libraries if you have multiple cards attached to Libby. I'm going to tap above this menu just to drop it out of the way. <clears throat> Up at the top of the screen here, you'll see this actions button. If you tap on actions when you're looking at a tag list, you can rename your tag or delete it. I always like to point out the delete option. If you don't want Libby auto tagging your books with that borrowed smart tag, you can certainly delete that if you'd like. And then right in the center here, we have export tag. So this is how you can share your tag lists with anyone you'd like. So I'll go ahead and walk through this process for you. We're gonna tap on export tag. Libby gives us a few options uh, as far as file types, depending on what you wanna do with it, you can choose different ones. I'm gonna go with table for our demonstration here. And now we're on the data export page. So you can see my tag list down here at the bottom. Now, if I scroll up, you'll see the share icon. It's that box with the arrow pointing upward. This is how you can share this list out. So we'll hit that and we can send it in a text message. We can send it in an email as well. Or if you're on a smaller device, you may have to scroll down a tiny bit. You'll also have the option to print the list out if maybe you want a physical copy as you go to the library or if you want to share it with a friend you can also print that wish list out as well so that is tip number three all about tagging titles tags are one of my absolute favorite uh, features of libby i could talk about them all day but i'll stop myself there and move on to our last tip of the day, which is going to be all about making notes and highlights in an ebook. So from my shelf, I'm gonna go ahead and open up this copy of Pride and Prejudice. Notes and highlights are great for students, for book clubbers, or if you are like Joe and I, just making notes is fun to do. So uh, this will be an option for you as well. You can highlight a word, a passage, a full paragraph. Uh, it doesn't really matter how uh, long, as long as it fits on one page. Now, what you're gonna do when you wanna make a note, I'm just gonna make a highlight on this paragraph here for you. And I'm moving my mouse slightly to the left so that you can see what happens as I hold my finger on the screen here. I'm holding my finger on this it turns blue. I say hold because if you tap, it's gonna turn the page. So hold your finger as soon as it makes contact with the screen, keep it there, and then drag your finger across the screen until the full passage turns blue. Then you can lift your finger up off the screen. Once you lift your finger up, you'll have the option to highlight. You could even choose some colors here if you wanna stay organized. So I chose yellow, now our highlight is placed. Now that the highlight is placed, I can tap on the highlight itself and that will allow us to add a note to the highlight. So I have written full paragraphs here, 
but I'm just going to do this is a note for the example. And then once that's typed in, I'm just going to drop that off the screen by tapping below the menu. And then let's page forward. So I'm just going to go ahead a little bit. Now, when you want to look at your notes and highlights in a book, you'll tap on the center of the screen. And then up at the top right hand corner, you'll see the three bookmarks sitting in a row. If you tap on those bookmarks, you will be able to see all of your notes and highlights that you've made inside that book. And these are all links. So maybe I want to look at this um, quote here that I that I highlighted. I'm going to tap on it. And Libby takes me right on back to that page. I can see what I highlighted and then I can tap on the highlight here to drop the note down and see what I said about that highlight. Now, sometimes you will make notes and highlights in a book and then the book returns to the library and when you want it to reference it, it has a waiting list so you can't borrow it again and find them this way. However, there's two other ways that you can find your notes and highlights from your Libby account without having to borrow the book. So let me show you how to do that before we wrap up. I'm going to leave this ebook center of the screen. I'm going to tap on back. And then what we're going to need to do is go to the details page of the book that we know that we made notes and highlights in. The easiest way that we're going to be able to do that is to go down to the search icon. In this instance, we know exactly what we're looking for here. And we'll type that title in. And now that I've typed it in, I'll tap on search. And this is another reason we love that borrowed smart tag. I know this is the book that I was looking for since I borrowed it in the past. I'm going to go ahead and tap on the jacket cover to view its details page. Now on the details page of any book that you've borrowed in the past, you will have a reading journey. Your reading journey starts as soon as you borrow a book and it just captures all of the actions that you take as that book is in your on your shelf. So we're popping into the reading journey here. Up in the top right hand corner, you'll see actions. So this should look familiar to you. We just talked about it with tags. In actions, you can export your reading data. So following the same steps for exporting tags, you can go through and print these out, your notes and highlights, you could email them or text them. Now, maybe that's just one step too far. You just wanna take a quick glance at a note that you made during book club, maybe. Instead of printing them out, what you can do is um, on the same reading journey page here, looks like I might've froze. There we go. Um, we're gonna scroll down just a tiny bit, same page, uh, reading journey. Under timeline for this title, you'll see your highlights listed out and you just have to tap on those individual highlights and you'll get a uh, little passage here. This is what we highlighted. And then right underneath that, we'll also see the note that is in quotations. So those are the two ways that you can find your notes and highlights even after a title has returned on its due date and you don't have access to it anymore. So that is tip number four. We're all finished with our tips here. I'm going to let Joe come back up. It looks like he's answering a question. Lots of good questions today, and we'll get into our Q&A. All right. Thanks, Marissa. Thank you for taking us through those tips. Um, the first thing I just wanted to mention, because um, kind of been trying to figure out what's going on with a device here. Um, Patricia, if you're using a Kindle, the you won't be able to download an audiobook uh, if you're using the browser at all. 
uh, you can't download. Uh, so whether you're using the Kindle Silk browser Lib or LibbyApp.com on a laptop or a desktop, you can't do any downloading if you're using the browser, only if you're in the Libby app. Then if you want to read offline, you can send ebooks to your Kindle following the steps Marissa mentioned earlier, but you won't be able to do that um, with, okay, not using a Kindle. Um, all right, Marissa, would you mind just trying to back and forth a little, get some info in the Q&A? Um, I would just confirm, uh, Patricia, can you confirm if you are using uh, the Libby app or are you going into a browser? Because if you, I, I see at some point I was advised that it was necessary to go through my browser to use Libby. Not the case. You should just download the Libby app to your device and that should, um, you know, you could be able to follow everything Marissa's shown her today. But Marissa's gonna reach out and help you. Um, so I will leave that to her. Uh, but we do have a question here from Tracy. And Marissa, I'm gonna take over with my iPad on the screen, just so you can not have to Vanna White for me. <laughs> so you can answer those questions. All right, sorry, everyone, give me one second. Okay. All right. So let me open up Libby here. And our first question that we'll be looking at is from Tracy. Can you highlight and make notes in a magazine? So unfortunately you can't highlight and make notes in a magazine, but I do recommend, um, I'm just gonna open Popular Mechanics back up. I do recommend that you leave a bookmark. So if you're going through a Food Network magazine or even like an HGTV article that you're going to want to return to later, if you tap in the center of your screen, up at the very top menu, underneath this list of bookmarks that Marissa took us to, there's just a little single bookmark. So if I tap on that, it leaves a bookmark for the page and I can always go back to that. Now, the really cool thing about magazines is that they're what we call simultaneous access. So you can um, check out a magazine at any time without ever having to worry about wait lists or holds. Uh, so everyone could read the same magazine at the same time. The other great thing with magazines is that they don't impact your loan and hold limit. So even though you can only borrow six ebooks or six audiobooks at a time, you can borrow a um, hundred magazines. Now that's, I don't know why you'd need a hundred magazines, but you could do it. So if you uh, make that bookmark, I then also recommend having uh, a tag just for like recipes. You saw Marissa's got her cookbook tag. If you have a recipe tag, you could always hop in and go to that bookmarked page whenever you want to go to that recipe or return to an article you want to see again. Uh, let's see. I see Marissa is typing, but I'm going to uh, just show on the screen how to change your default lending period. Um, so of course, remember uh, that you will need to, oh, that's a bad example, Oops, sorry. Uh, the first time you make that change, kind of like Marissa mentioned in the basics, it will uh, only change that one format. So if you borrow an ebook, the default will change going forward. If you borrow, you'll still have to change it when you borrow an audiobook to change that audiobook default. So I'm going to just get to my borrowing page. When you're on this screen and you can see you are borrowing people we meet on vacation for 21 days. 21 days is underlined. So if I tap on that, I'll have options pop up here. If your default is 14, you can change it up to 21. And once you make that change and borrow the first time, it will stick and stay. Since this is an ebook, all my ebooks will now be 21 days, uh, but you'll have to think about that the first time you borrow an audiobook. Great questions. 
great questions, everyone. I just wanted to look through some of the things we answered during the session to make sure we've got, if there was anything else I wanted to just point out again. All right, and just wanted to throw it out there, of course, um, if it, Marissa mentioned you can return books early, you can also renew titles if there isn't a wait list. So if you're at the end of your three week lending period and you'd like a little more time with it, uh, as long as there's no one waiting, you could always renew that. And we can go to our shelf. And then next to the title we want to renew, we'll tap on manage loan. And then we would tap on renew loan. Now, if you remember, this is the title we borrowed in our basics portion. Uh, and you can only renew a title three days before it's due, uh, which is why I can't tap into it right now. It is grayed out. All right. And then, um, so the Libby app is only available to download on Apple mobile devices and Android mobile devices. You can only download Libby on an iPhone or an iPad or any form of Android smartphone or tablet. Currently, the Libby app is not available for Kindle Fire devices. You can use the browser to go to libbyapp.com on your Kindle Fire or use a different device to send ebook titles to your Kindle. Um, but unfortunately, Amazon makes decisions as, to far, as far as what's available in their app store, and we are still waiting for Libby to be accepted. And then Ellie, great question. Unfortunately, I can't show you how to do that in the webinar because the link doesn't exist yet. If you'd like to keep the video uh, permanently, you're going to get an email. It'll have a link to the recording. You'll tap through it. And if you'd like to keep that video forever, as well as a copy of the Q&A responses, there's just a big old button that says download. You can't miss it. You'll need to do that on a computer, though, if you'd like to keep the video permanent. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time and your patience. We are heading toward uh, the end of our time together here. Uh, let's see. All right. And I am just going to give a final few notes. Just please remember you'll get an email around this time tomorrow morning from Zoom. That includes a link to everything we've promised, the recording of our webinar, as well as our basics PDF. A quick note on that, there was a very recent update to Libby. Uh, so you will see one difference in the recordings that the menu button that all day today you've seen as three lines is going to show up in that video as Libby's face, but all of the buttons and functionality are in the same place. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us today. In just a moment here, Marissa and I are both going to mute and go off camera to finish answering these questions. Uh, but if you are waiting for an answer, stick around. Otherwise, you are more than welcome to exit the webinar. So thank you so much for joining us today. And of course, happy reading.
right, thank you so much, everyone. We are going to now end the webinar. Please feel free to fill out the survey that pops up. Have a wonderful day and happy reading.